Yo! Welcome back and welcome to the first edition of the weekly Web3 News Roundup, which is something that I'm going to try to do every Friday. So yeah, let's get right into it. So first up this week, we have an article by Signal founder and well-known cryptographer Moxie Marlinspike on his first impressions of Web3. Uh, the article is pretty well written and actually does a good job of pointing out some of the problems that we currently have with Web3. One of the main things that he points out is sort of Web3's focus on decentralization when in reality on the back end a lot of things seem to be more centralized than most people think. One of his prime examples is the fact that people don't want to and can't run their own full nodes for most people of, for instance, the Ethereum blockchain. And so we rely on centralized entities like Infira. Uh, this definitely is a problem that we need to look into and keep top of mind. Uh, but there are other providers for the blockchain nodes that you can use. So we aren't necessarily tied to just Infira, like as if it were a Twitter database where we're tied to Twitter's API or something like that. Um, yeah, and one of the other points that he makes on the decentralization aspect of everything is how NFTs aren't actually owned by the users. One of the reasons that he says this is because the art isn't stored as a cryptographic hash anywhere, and so the developer can change it at any time. Um, this is really only half true. Um, it's only true for projects that don't use a decentralized file server like IPFS to host the actual files and metadata. Um, if it's hosted on IPFS, which is sort of the standard the gold standard for any of these decentralized projects to not store it on your own server is to store it on ipfs or another decentralized file server uh, then it actually is stored as a pure cryptographic hash and if the developer or the smart contract owner does change the um what the picture is you actually at least have a verifiable history that this changed because the hash is different here uh, and you'll have that on the blockchain as well. Uh, he points out this problem by making an NFT. It's actually kind of funny. He makes an NFT that looks like one thing on OpenSea, like a cool sort of generative art thing, and another type of generative art on um, Rarible. And then if you look at it in your wallet, it's just a poop emoji. Uh, yeah, I thought that was pretty funny. And it just kind of points out how, again you can change the image based on where something is being served if the developer is actually hosting and serving the image itself. This is something that's solved by IPFS, so I don't think this is really too big of an issue, and I think he just didn't look that far into it. Um, the other thing that he does point out that I think is important is that OpenSea removed his NFT, probably because it changes based on what platform you're on, uh, and he mentioned how that's not really decentralized because OpenSea removed it, so he can't view his NFT on OpenSea, but it also disappeared from his MetaMask wallet as well, uh, basically giving him the idea that he lost his token or that his token was removed. Um, yeah, really, this is just, it's, uh, his token is still there, it's still on chain, and this is just a basically problem with the fact that OpenSea is a centralized platform that is using the these decentralized blockchains, but their actual ownership is centralized and they make central or take central actions based on their authority, such as removing projects or we've seen them lock trading of other NFTs. Um, but those tokens are still tradable on any other platform or directly on the blockchain. And also his mention of how MetaMask also wouldn't show the NFT. I think this really just shows a glaring problem with the fact that why is MetaMask using the OpenSea API? They should be either using the graph themselves and pulling the data off the blockchain or using a reputable API whose sole business is data APIs for the blockchain. This week also saw the launch of the LuxRare platform, which is aiming to be a decentralized alternative to OpenSea. Uh, it's something that NFT traders and enthusiasts have kind of been clamoring about for a long time, which is to have a better alternative to OpenSea and an alternative that 
aims to be more decentralized. A lot of the gripes about OpenSea has been that it's fairly centralized and a, a lot of that comes down to the fact that they aren't planning to offer a token drop or anything to their users, but instead it looks like they're gonna IPO and go public on a stock exchange. And they've had outages the last couple days, some pretty long outages where people just couldn't trade on the platform. And LooksRare really took advantage of this opportunity uh, and they've really blown up. They started with a token drop, which is the one thing that people wanted the most from OpenSea. Um, and they based their token drop based on how much other users had traded, I believe, on OpenSea. Um, and they're also releasing tokens based on how much you... I believe if it's if you traded over 3F on OpenSea, they gave you an allocation of Lux tokens. And you can also learn, earn Lux tokens by trading on their platform over these first 30 days. Which causes a, another little problem we'll get into in a little bit here. But yeah, overall, I think LuxRare has done a really good job launching a platform to compete with OpenSea. Um, and they plan to allow some community governance. And yeah, I think uh, I'm going to take a look at some numbers here just so you can see how good OpenSea has actually done compared or how good LuxRare has done compared to OpenSea since launching. Um, so yeah, according to Dune Analytics, in the first, what, four days that they've been live, five days that they've been live, they've already processed over 550 million in tra Oh, no, that's just... They've already processed over $1.5 billion worth in volume, which is almost double what OpenSea has done in the same time period. OpenSea's done $775 million. Um, just yesterday... Looks rare traded $550 million worth of volume compared to $215 million from OpenSea. And yeah, I think what you can see here though is there's a big discrepancy in terms of users and transactions, where OpenSea has a lot more users and processed over 500,000 transactions compared to only 11,000 on Looks Rare. Um, and then you think, how is this possible? How is Looks Rare trading so much more volume with only 11,000 transactions? And the answer to that goes back to one of the problems that I think I see with how they're doing their token airdrop, which is that the more volume you trade on the Looks Rare platform, the more of the allocation you're going to get in these first 30 days of the looks token airdrop and people really want these looks tokens because they're valuable you can stake them to get earnings in f of the trading royalties that the platform takes um, so people really want these tokens and so what they're doing is they're wash trading amongst themselves basically just trading an nft to another at to another wallet that they also own and trading them for obscenely high prices to try and make it look like they're contributing a lot more volume. Uh, some people are probably even doing this with flash loans, so they're trading a lot more than they even have. Um, this is evident by, we had a MeBit sell recently for, let's see here, sold for 14,700 ETH, which is $50 million. That's absurd for a me bit. And yeah, it's all just people rushing in and trying to game the system to get as many looks tokens as possible. Uh, but even despite some of this gaming, I think it's really promising that we have another platform that people really like using that can compete with OpenSea because we definitely needed a good competitor to OpenSea. And yeah, hopefully we can see where the looks our platform goes. It looks good so far. This week also saw a pretty interesting news story about two congressional candidates who were able to sell NFTs to raise some campaign funds, even though it was to varying degrees of success. Um, so we had California Democratic House candidate Srina, Srina Karani, and she was able to raise only $6,610 and sold less than a dozen tokens by the time her mint ended. Um, but still encouraging that she was getting into the game and trying out to see what this new space 
had to offer. Um, and then on the better end, we had Arizona Senate candidate Blake Masters, who might have had a little bit of extra help here, and you'll see why in a second. But he sold uh, about five $575,000 worth of NFTs that were depicting the cover art for a book he wrote by probably who was a little bit of his help, a book he wrote with Peter Thiel. While it's been legal to collect campaign contributions in cryptocurrencies for the last eight years, it's still not very widely used, and NFTs definitely throw a new wrinkle into the space, so we'll see how that ends up evolving over time. And to keep the good NFT news rolling, we also saw the announcement that the Associated Press is going to launch their own NFT photography platform. Uh, we still don't know too much about the platform, but we know they're going to launch on Polygon to be a little more environmentally friendly and to help users save on gas costs. And we also know, being a nonprofit, that they're planning to use the funds from the platform as well as royalty fees to use to fund both the photographers who are taking the pictures as well as to fund the journalists who help do the reporting for the Associated Press. In some more technical news, we saw the version 1 launch of the Ethereum Push Notification Service, or EPNS. Uh, EPNS is basically working on building a communication layer for Web3, and they launched initially with um, some pretty big projects like Aave and MakerDAO uh, and Uniswap. And yeah, basically what EPNS aims to do is to allow contracts and users to send notifications to other addresses. Um, this is something that's kind of badly missing from Web3 right now and will open up a lot of cool things. So it'll allow you to send messages back and forth between wallet addresses and know when you get a message, such as if you want to maybe buy an NFT that someone has that isn't listed or buy an ENS domain that they have. Um, yeah, it gives you a way to communicate between wallets. Uh, it also gives the ability for protocols and contracts to communicate with you when something happens. So uh, let's say you're on a DeFi protocol and you're about to be liquidated. You could get a notification that that's going to happen. Or if you're a member of a DAO, the DAO could send out a notification to all members who hold the DAO token that an important vote is coming up. Um, yeah, I think push notifications and notifications are something that are essential in the current state of the web and the current state of social interaction and getting something like that to work on the blockchain uh, will be key to web3 adoption and i think epns is showing some some great momentum here so i'm bullish on where this goes on Wednesday, we saw Simplified Asset Management file with the SEC to create the first Web3-focused ETF. Uh, this ETF aims to just give some broad exposure to investors to the Web3 space. They don't plan to hold any actual like native crypto assets like Bitcoin or Ether. Uh, they do plan to gain some exposure to that by holding 10% of their assets in the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. But I believe most of the funding for um, this ETF or most of the holdings of the ETF are going to be just companies and assets in the blockchain space. Um, not sure what that makeup is going to look like yet, but it's definitely a good sign to see that not just crypto and um, Bitcoin or Ether as an investment gaining sort of some of this trust in the institutional investors and in the broad market. Uh, we're seeing just Web3 as a whole start to gain that exposure. Um, I think that'll be really good to start for investors to start seeing the potential of this space. Uh, hopefully as they see their pocketbooks rise as the space grows, they start becoming more interested and dive in themselves. Near Protocol announced yesterday that they raised $150 million to help drive Web3 adoption. Uh, Near Protocol is an Ethereum proof of stake competitor, and they're planning to use these funds to help hold events and do other things to drive education and adoption of not just Near Protocol, but blockchain technology in general, Well, which I think is pretty cool because we definitely need more awareness and more general widespread education about what these platforms are and how to use these protocols um yeah and their funding it was 
So their funding round was led by Three Arrows Capital and uh, had participation from a number of different well-known crypto investors. Uh, A16Z took part. They're in basically every crypto deal. Um, Near Protocol has had a lot of funding in the past. I think last year they had like $800 million in funding or something like that. Or maybe they had an $800 million fund to give out to different developers to help build Web3. Um, so yeah, it's really cool that Near Protocol is doing a lot to help drive adoption, not just of their protocol, but of Web3 in general. All right, and the last bit of news this week, because it's super wildcard weekend in the NFL, I've got some football-themed news. It's not quite NFL news, but fan-controlled football raised $40 million this week from Animoca Brands, among a list of other investors, with the primary focus of it being to A, fund Season 2, and B, make a big move into the crypto and Web3 space. Uh, so if you don't know what the fan-controlled football league is, it's a league that started last year and allows fans to vote in the decisions that the team makes. Um, so fans get to vote on things that a, dis that a general manager might make, like who should we sign, who should be on the roster, or coaching decisions, uh, maybe like who should play or what play call should we make, should we run, pass, punt, onside kick, uh, puts a lot more of the ownership in the hands of the fans and I think drives a lot of engagement for the fans because they're actually seeing the decisions they make playing out on the field. Um, so yeah, they're planning to use the $40 million to help run Season 2 of the league, which will be streaming not only on Twitch like last year, but also on NBC and Peacock. And along with Season 2, they have doubled the league from four teams to eight teams and this is where it gets really cool for web three all four of the additional teams are going to be managed and owned by nft communities or people in the nft space so three of them are just straight nft communities and one of them is sort of an nft community slash a team between two nft two big people in the nft space um, so those four new teams are going to be a team ran by the board apes yacht club uh, we'll have a team ran by the gutter cat gang um, we'll have a team ran by the knights of dgen which is a sports focused nft project uh, and i believe the barber twins tiki and ronde had something to do with the founding of the knights of dgen or at least their members of it and then the last team is a collaboration between Steve Aoki and um, noted NFT figure 888. Uh, that's going to be called Team 8 Aoki. Uh, and in addition to if you are a holder of one of these projects that owns a team, you're going to have pre-sale access to an NFT mint that the Fan Controlled Football League is actually putting out, which I think also is going to come with a lot of different cool access to control different parts of league governance and team governance and stuff like that um so yeah if you hold a board ape a gutter cat gang a knights of degen or i guess i'm not sure if you just have to hold an 888 project nft to have access for that team um, but you'll get access to the fcf ballers collection when that comes out uh, before their public sale um, yeah, I think this is really cool to see a sports organization start pushing more into the Web3 space and especially that they're thinking about decentralized ownership. It kind of goes hand in hand with the fan controlled aspect of decision making. Um, but I, I see the long term play of them going to more decentralized community fan ownership. And yeah, I think that's really cool. We've seen a couple other projects try to do something like this, like Krauss House style to buy a basketball team. Um, but this is the first one that seems to really be, like, it's not big league pros, but it seems to be like it's a uh, somewhat successful collaboration between a league and decentralized community ownership. So I'm excited to see where it goes. Uh, yeah, tune in to Fan Controlled Football Season 2. All right, there's your weekly Web3 news. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, and remember to like this video and subscribe if you'd like to keep up to date on any other news in Web3. Uh, hope to see you back here next week and have a good weekend.